Well, everybody, good evening, good afternoon. Are we people to join Michelle? Good morning. Um, just uh, thank you for joining us this evening for us here in the UK uh, for our live and final session. So this is number five of our intergenerational dialogues on cultural resistance. And if you've been following the series so far, we've had um, four. The first one we had group one, which we had our 18 to 29 year olds. Group two was 30 to 49 year olds. Group three was our 50 year olds plus. And then the fourth session, which was last week, was our first combined intergenerational session where we address the topic of language and cultural practices in relation to cultural resilience. So just for those of you who've been following and for those who, this, if this is your first time watching, um, please forgive us. We'll be speaking in English throughout this session because um, some of the panelists, it's easy, easier for us to express ourselves in English and also for the sake of the recording. For those who are watching, it allows for more people to be able to understand what we're saying. Panelists have um, the opportunity to speak in Fijian if they'd like to, and we'd like to encourage them if they'd like to express themselves better that way, then that's what we, we would like to see. So I hope everybody's have had a really good Fiji Day celebration and celebrating Fiji 50. And I think some celebrations are still going on and why not? Because there's nothing else that we can do. So we might as well keep <laughs> celebrating our country. <laughs> uh, so just uh, as a short recap, um, last week's session was on language and cultural practices. And it was, the, as I mentioned earlier, it was the first combined session of all three groups. And that was quite interesting because what it did is it was the first time that we allowed a space for three different generations to come together and speak about their own personal experiences, their own opinions and how they viewed language and cultural practices in relation to them maintaining their cultural identity here in the UK, but also whilst going back to Fiji for visits and for some of them whilst living in Fiji as well. This week we'll be speaking about identity and duality and joining me I have Brittany who was in group one, we have uh, Philo who was also in group two, uh, she was although she was moderating it for Mork, um, Taltal and Nimi was meant to join us this evening but unfortunately due to work commitments he has sent his apologies in so Philo standing in for him this evening and we have Ola and Anna from group three. So this evening these lovely ladies and I have joined to have a little talanoa about identity and duality. So some things that came out of our dis pre previous discussions were how we identify as Fijians here living in the UK and also when we go back home. So some points that came up were as Fijians, we are bold in our identity, um, that not everybody has the same experiences in relation to the assimilation into British life and culture. So everybody has different experiences of how they've lived here in the UK. The idea of duality and having being able to navigate both Fijian and British circles and one session uh, really shared about how that's rather than something to be ashamed about is something that we should really be proud of. And um, the fact that there's a dichotomy between Fijian and British cultures and because they're so different, and this is sometimes reflected in different generations in terms of how a person identifies. So what we found throughout the sessions was um, so far, it seemed that group one and group three seemed to have a lot more similarities than group two. And it could be that that's possibly due to our panelists and their different upbringings. So group two, we, a lot of, uh, I think all our panelists were brought up in Fiji and moved to the UK as adults. 
rather than group one and group three, whom majority of them moved to the UK when they were children or when they were born or they were born here. And uh, the final point in terms of uh, identity was for us not to mix fact with opinion. The fact is at the end of the day that we are Fijian and it is someone's opinion if, if they believe that we are not Fijian enough. So with that in light, um, I'd like to start our discussion today. So the, the um, what's the word? The way we will do it <laughs> is that each panelist uh, will pose a question to either a specific generation or to a uh, or to all the panelists and then we'll just have an open discussion and continue to let it flow so um ladies was there anything else that you wanted to say before we begin no okay so let's start so first, uh, if we could have um, a question from Brittany, please. Hey, Bula, everyone. Um, well, my first question was, um, it's, it's, um, what kind of problems did you face um, when growing up in the UK or coming to the UK at a young age or whenever you did come as a Fijian and how did you overcome it? Um, and this is aimed at all the panelists or whoever would like to answer the question. So, Anna, would you like to start? Okay, so thank you for the question, Brittany. Really, really interesting question. And thanks for the introduction, Sai, and just um, providing the context for the discussions today. It's wonderful to be with you all and thank you for inviting me back. Um, but yeah, just thinking about that problem, how, how have you handled problems um, or the, the difficulties that you faced? And maybe I'll speak about, uh, you know, when, when I was a child and we, we came to Fiji and then when I came back to England um, and how I responded to problems which we encountered when we just got back to England and were trying to kind of reorient ourselves back into British life mm. um, after having left as a child and then coming back. And um, I mean, one of the things that really helped us at that time when I was trying to kind of get, you know, we're trying to get settled in England and we were really trying, trying to find our way into the British system. So you were trying to kind of make sure that you got your national insurance number because we'd been away for so, I've been away for so long and all of that stuff, you know? So you're kind of navigating the systems and the processes of being, um, of, uh, being back in England, even though I, I carried a British passport. So, and one of the things that really helped at that time was the, was the presence of the Fijian network, the Fijian community. Um, and, and, you know, they were really instrumental in terms of guiding us through, or me and Sai and her dad through, or her Sai wasn't there yet, but me and, and, and Sai's dad, we're just trying to get settled back in the UK. Um, and so I think in terms of dealing with the problems, we, the Fijian community is so good in that sense, you know, like we, we kind of help each other out and we needed a lot of help. Mm -hmm. So, um, at that time, um, I should mention, uh, so I used to call her Bumbulu, uh, um, uh, Mrs. Wanganika, who was the first secretary at the Fijian High Commission in London. Mm -hmm. um, she was there at the time that we moved back to England and she was really instrumental in kind of helping us get settled. And Anna Harvey was the same, who was on the panel when we did our discussion and she was also part of the panel last week. So, um, you know, the strength of, of just having that network um, because we were coming in really in the cold. So when, when we were there as children, the, the army was, it was all like a really protected space because the army takes care of, of us. We were army children, you know, and my parents had had it all sorted, but coming back in um, and dealing with the problems of trying to integrate. Mm. And then there was the two on two network, you know, there was people like Uncle Lusa, Moswale, Uncle Nembuk and Garao, just having them around um, was really, really helpful. Just trying to kind of navigate the systems and get back into British life. Mm. Yeah, so I would say, you know, the in dealing with the problems, um, mm. 
So the, again, I, I guess it brings up this whole thing about duality and identity. Mm. You can carry the, the British passport, mm. um, but the strength of the Fijian relationships is what also really helps you navigate through difficult seasons and, and trying to get settled back in a country, which is, it, even though I was born in England, I'd been away since I was, you know, I left when I was six years old, mm -hmm. coming back in as an adult, that integration is difficult if you don't have people who are doing it or have done it before you. And the people that did it before us who knew how to do it were people from the Fijian community. So that was a real blessing. And I am really thankful to everybody. And then we became that for everybody else who came in afterwards, you know? So you, you kind of just provide that support for people. Mm -hmm. And there's always, um, in any community, there's always issues, you know? But that's human beings are complex. We, we, every, there are no communities where there are no issues, but mm -hmm. the strength of um, our relationships, mm -hmm. the strength of family, the strength of, um, of just how we look out for each other, I think is something that we really should continue to, to recognize. Mm -hmm. And yes, there are always going to be issues, but then if you didn't have the issues, you wouldn't know the joy. So yeah, polarity. Yeah. So I guess that's my response to your question, Brittany. Thank you for asking it. Oh, thank you. I think, sorry, I just wanted to say that that's, that's, uh, that's quite interesting and makes me think of my parents when they came here and the sort of their family that were already here that helped them um, integrate into the community as well. So having that community and family who are already established here really helps and goes a long way. So yeah, thank yeah. you for that answer. Thank you. Um, Paula, do you want to answer or feel or do you want to go next? Um, with my situation, it, it's, a, it's a bit different because um, I, I was born here and um, so uh, mum and dad, well, mum was like the first out of the two, one, two, she was the first um, a female mother, well, mother that came over with all the soldiers. So mum and dad have always um, been inviting other people over so we always had everybody come to visit us and dad would you know sort of signpost them and say oh yeah you need to go and see such and such and see such and such so we were so used to having people come and visit us you know and you know like when dad left the army he um in, was sort of like um helped the new recruits and just sort of like told them what to expect you know living on this side um but like Anna says, we, we were very lucky because because there weren't so many Fijians, there was a t just the 212 at that time. Um, when we went to it, all the Fijian do's and things, it was always auntie and uncle. <laughs> so we knew everybody as auntie and uncle. Everybody. everybody was auntie and uncle, no matter what. So whenever we saw them, it was like, oh, hello, auntie, hello, uncle. And, you know, it was like they would, all, would always look after us, you know, and we could go and ask them. And you no, know, still to this day, I still call them uncle and auntie from all the, all the Fijians, you know, that were then, and mm -hmm. and that was our like community that we had. Mm -hmm. But you know, they were very very close, and they they you know sort of like um, because they were so spread out, um, they used to always have a plan of like if there was any news that they because we didn't have all the technology that we have today, they'd have like little you know sort of groups or you let that group know. You're, you ring that group so when something happened then they'd um you know so they'd all find out and communicate with each other mm. so that was a, a big you know uh, thing for us so um that's that's the most experience I really had you know sort of like with the aunt of the Fijians coming over mm. um I think like you said I just when I as I said earlier that with me I, I did have an identity crisis growing up because I wasn't around Fijians um but obviously um uh, mum and dad are really supportive and they sort of like helped me through that mm. but that, that was just something and I and I think because I I wasn't sure where I wasn't mixing with Fijians all the time that I felt that when Fijians looked at me that they think oh she doesn't speak Fijian so that was my problem yeah but you know so as I've grown up you know now that I'm older I just recognize now I am Fijian like I said yeah. so so that's my experience. Mm. Okay. <laughs> I, for me, if I build on um, 
what Ulla's just said. Mm. I think one of the issues that I had could be similar to what Ulla's saying in terms of growing up, nobody in my primary school knew where Fiji was. Right. So no one knew what <laughs> where Fiji was, what, what Fiji was, and like where I was from. So I was always grouped into either like, South Asian descent mm. or uh, mixed race. So they just assumed that, you know, I, my mother or father was one was English and the other was either of um, Black Caribbean or African heritage. So I kind of didn't really think of it as anything, my identity as a Fijian, but it wasn't until. Um, I used to go, tra go travel back to Fiji to see my grandparents. I knew where I was from and I was proud of where I was from, but I'd come back to England, it would still be the same thing. No one would know where Fiji was because in the early nineties, there wasn't many Fijians here in the UK. Mm. And it wasn't until um, I moved back to Fiji with my mom, I think four years. And that's when I really like just, fell in love with like the culture and, and I felt at home so I was like this is where I'm from these are my people I'm here so when I came back that 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 experience helped me to come back to the UK and feel more secure in who I was yeah so I think in terms of my problem and what I had it was the fact that I was able to grow up in Fiji for a few years and that really instilled that because I think even if I traveled back um, yearly, I would come back and it's I would come back to England and there still wouldn't be a lot of people who knew. Mm -hmm. But also now the fact there are more Fijian communities here in the UK and there's more Fijians all across the UK. Mm -hmm. It's much nicer. Mm -hmm. But then at one point I was I was the kid who would see a Fijian person and be like, oh, Bola. But then now it's gone to the point where there's so many Fijian people around, you kind of just nod your head and walk in the <laughs> other direction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so true. Which I think we, sh we shouldn't do. And we should really just continue to shout and bulla to Fijians that we see in the street and introduce <laughs> ourselves, even if we're doing it in Fijian or English. Yeah. Because really, what are the odds of meeting someone else from our tiny but mighty island nation true. in the middle of like... I don't know, the Lake District. <laughs> <laughs> For me, I moved to the UK as a 28 year old in 20, 2014. So not too long ago. One of the th challenges I found were, was initially the, of course, the winter. I moved around Jan, yeah, January. So it was really cold. And I, that was one of the main challenges for me. Another one was, of course, the, the isolation. Because I moved as an adult, I had left already established, you know, my friendships, my um, the old girls networks, my professional networks. So there was a whole lot of isolation in that sense. And I had to come here and sort of try to rebuild that. Mm. Still trying to, to be honest. Um, as well as the, um, a lot of things, but I, when going into the workplace, coming as a, um, an adult and then going into the British workplace, it is very different from what I had it while working in Fiji. So one of the key main things I struggled with was communication. And um, I think working in Fiji, where we'd work on similar kind of work and working on projects, you'd sort of you know, have your meetings, you decide on what you need to do, you put your head down and you work and get it done and, until it's finished. Whereas here, the work culture is quite different and that's something I struggled to learn at first and that was the communication. You sort of have to over communicate. I found it quite overwhelming at first and I had to learn it quite quickly in order to you know, to go to fit into the work dynamic of, a, a work, you know, working in England, which is very different from Fiji. So yeah, that, those are the things I struggled with uh, coming to the UK from Fiji. Mm. 
Thank you, Phil. And Phil, just to add to your your like, just to ask a question. Were, were there people in the community here that you befriended or family members that lived here that that could help you through that process? Or was there anybody who gave you advice on what to do? Absolutely. I think I was lucky as well when I came here. That there were a lot of Fijians around and I had a lot of relatives here as well already. So a lot of cousins who I could, um, you know, ask for tips and who would help me settle in and, you know, just help with the homesickness and all of that. So I was uh, lucky in that sense. There were a lot of Fijians already here and a lot of my relatives were here already. Mm. Mm. I think it's quite nice that, like, um, thank you, Brittany, for the, your question, because it's really shown that even though all of our experiences have been different, mm. a key aspect of, in it was the community, mm. the community that was already here, if it was only 212 back when um, Ola and Anna first moved to the UK or were born in the UK, mm. to, to now when Philo moved here, it just <clears throat> really shows that throughout everything, we do turn, end up turning to people of our own culture and people that we're familiar with because it feels familiar. Mm. And it's nice that we're there, that we're there for each other as a community. Mm. So I, I like that. Mm. Yeah, if I, if I can just add that, I think um, if it wasn't for my mum's family being here already and, and my, my nana, my mum's mum, like urging them to come saying come you have to come my parents to come they wouldn't have made that move so if it wasn't for that family that was already here they wouldn't they just know they they already set on staying in Fiji so it really does matter that we have that um yeah just that community here to help us hmm. yeah. and I, I just thought I mean I wanted to pick up on some two things that Philo said as well you know just um that even though we do have community, there's still like um, the isolation, I think of being, is still felt quite, uh, you do feel that when you move from a place as small as Fiji to a place like England, you know, you even though you have community, just the way that life happens in the UK is so different from the way that life happens in Fiji, you know? You need to make appointments to see people in England. You need to plan things like a week out and what, how are you going to get the train and blah, 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 you know, like in Fiji, I just go around the corner and I meet my friend at the coffee shop, you know, and, yeah. and so, and some of it's just random meetings of where you meet at the market and then you spend the whole day together, you know, so it's just so different. And so when you're trying to move back to integrate into life in England, these are some of the things that you really struggle with, you know, and, and I also really like just thinking of what Philo said, the work culture, yeah. you know, and just the communication aspect in being in the work culture. Yeah, and I don't know whether this is something that, you know, you, Ma, uh, Marama Alliance UK can help people with, but it's such a huge thing. I, yeah. I experienced that when mm -hmm. I came back, I'd worked, I came back to England as an adult with, um, and just trying, even though like you have the passport, you know, you can get your national insurance number, all of that, blah, blah trying to get back into the workspace was hugely challenging. Um, so I came from working in a posh five-star hotel at the Sheraton where I was doing the, their PR for them mm. to working in a nursing home, not residential, nursing. Mm. So, you know, um, and it was really different. So, but that was my first experience of integration back into the UK because I needed to get a job to live. Mm. Um, and it was, it's huge, just uh, trying to kind of assimilate, you know, yeah. back in. And so, yeah, so community, you know, we're there, but um, it's still, there's still like lots of things that you really struggle with, I think, as you're kind of trying to integrate back into and, and dealing with this identity things yeah. that we struggle with. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of pick up on that because I think they're really, really good points that Philo made. Mm. Thank you, Philo. And it's interesting how, with with that being said, we almost form a new identity when we come, because we're we're all trying to maneuver through being isolated and oh gosh, everybody does things by appointments here, but I still just want to like turn up at my friend's house. So you kind of like 
have this mixture of two different influences that you, I don't know, need to find a way to create a system of like managing both in mm -hmm. some way. Okay, let's carry on. <laughs> Thank you, Brittany, for that. So, uh, Anna, if we could have your yeah. question next, please. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Sai. So my question um, is really for Brittany and for Sai as the, as the younger generation, um, is what is one aspect of your dual identity that you've struggled with the most? Okay. Sai, do you want to go first or shall I? I'll let you go first. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think for me personally, um, the thing that I struggled with the most is, yes, like I can adapt to British culture and I can in some ways adapt to the Fijian culture, but I think in most ways, sometimes I feel that I'm not fully British. I'm not fully Fijian in, in a sense, like I don't know the Fijian language, so then I'm not fully Fijian. So I can't really like understand certain things. And then also with the British culture, I'm also not fully British because oh where are you from I'm from Fiji so I have that sort of sense of like oh like feeling of not feeling fully either one of them but also feeling like I'm both so that's sort of what I struggle with and I think because I speak to my sisters about this as well and like my cousins and we all have this shared sense of um yeah not feeling fully British not feeling fully Fijian um I don't know if Sai kind of feels this way as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the thing that I struggle with the most I'm still struggling with today. Yeah, I think. Thank you, Brittany. It's, prob it's probably the same with as Brittany. Um, that I, yeah, it's like sometimes I'm so, so I have, I, I work for a, uh, an organization that's based all over the world and we have an office in Suva. Yeah. So I have two colleagues who are there and um, it's funny because when they start speaking to me in Fiji and I can't really respond very well. <laughs> yeah. But this is the thing because when I'm here everybody says oh Sai she's from Fiji she's based in the London office and then I start talking to them and then they're just kind of like oh yeah I'm Pollard and then I'm just like yep okay. <laughs> And then I feel like, I don't know, I feel like I have to like over explain myself. Mm. So I like get to this point where I'm kind of like, oh, and I ended up telling them my life story. So I'm to kind of justify yeah. why I can't speak Fijian or how to justify how Fijian I really am. So I go on this long thing about oh my parents moved to England when I was like three years old and then I moved back so I spent a few years in Fiji and I've got really good friends there and I go back every year and I'm really close to my family and my mum lives there and so you know and but as I'm getting older I'm realizing that it's really tiring <laughs> mm. uh, but I guess something that hasn't left me is like my passion for for my country and the people so even though that was a, that is some the most difficult thing for me is I'm kind of, I'm kind of learning that it is part of who I am. Yeah. And slowly I'm I've stopped justifying mm. how Fiji and I am to other people. So mm. I'll introduce myself. I'll say where I'm from. I'll say my father's village and my mother's village, and then I'll just leave it at that because at the end of the day. Um, I know where I'm from and I don't know yeah mm. but I, I think this is what I wanted to talk to you guys about so it's funny because when we think of identity it could mean so many things couldn't it, it mm. like it could be linked to like your nationality so mm. we have like our citizenship if you have a British passport a Fijian passport a Samoan passport, a French passport, you know, for our for the our friends living in France as well. And that's one form of identity. And then you also have your ethnicity, which is often linked to like where you're from. So people will say that you're 
they sort of like say, oh, we're Pacific Islanders, but you're a Fijian. That's like your, you know, that could be seen as your like your ethnic background. You're from Ni Vanuatu, you're Samoan. Mm. And that's more like cultural characteristics. But then there's also like your identity, your racial identity. So I always found that question really confusing when people ask me in a context away from Fiji or when I'm not with Fijian people, if people ask me, where are you from? Yeah. And that whole idea of identity, like, do I tell you what, what my passport says? <laughs> do I tell you where I live or what county I live in or what town I'm from? Like, or do I tell you like my ethnic background and mm. my cultural upbringing? So I think, yeah, that's uh, that was also something that I I think of a lot. Mm. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> yeah. I don't know if anybody feels the same or. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's something. Sorry, I'll just jump in. Sorry, I think it's something that you, we all struggle with. You know, it's and it's the, the thing about being in two different cultures. It's the thing about who who are you really? If someone to, want to ask you, who are you? What would you like, how do you see yourself? And I think that's all that's really important is how you see you. Um, because then once you're kind of comfortable with how you see you, then that's what you bring to the world. Yeah. You know, because we can't influence the way that people see us, but we can influence the way that we see ourselves. And I think um, I like, like how Sai was saying, uh, you know, um just in Brittany just this thing about not being sure like because you're not fully this and you're not fully that and then Sai, like Sai's thing about just not having to kind of over explain yourself yeah. because you know who you are and I think it, it's we're like we're really gifted with the, we're privileged to have this opportunity to navigate these two spaces you know but we, we don't recognize that often enough and, and I think it's because we're always looking to other people to reaffirm us in who we are. Yeah. But once you're kind of comfortable in who you are yourself, that's who you bring to the table. You know, and, and I, even up until now, I still, when I go into meetings here, um, especially when you're working with people who are not from here, and you open your mouth. I mean, I remember we were at a meeting recently or some time ago, and we, we, we were explaining everything about whatever we were there to talk about and the lady who was there um the only thing she said oh you speak so well what school did you go to <laughs> you know so the assumption is if you look like this you're 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 not you're you're, you're like they put you in a box you put you you know so if you look like this and you you live in fiji you go and articulate something and they say to you oh um what like they completely forget everything that you said and then they ask you what school did you go to you speak so well what school did you go to you know and they come they immediately want to find out like what's your identity or all that you know that side just tried to try just explain to us um yeah but i think the key thing is really you know when this came out in our discussion earlier is just this celebration yeah. like just being completely comfortable with who you are because we're all so unique you know and the world is i remember the conversations that we were having with ula you know and ula was talking about how multicultural the uk is becoming yeah. um and how diverse it's becoming and i think we're coming to a time where the di the more diverse you are the more celebrated you will be you know because it reflects your ability to relate to people from different cultures and identify with people from different backgrounds and we do that so so very well you know that um that's what we as fijians i think we bring to the table because we just we do it so naturally mm -hmm. so i'd really just kind of encourage you guys you know just um be completely comfortable with your duality because it's wonderful to have you're privileged you're, pri you're in a very privileged position mm -hmm. so i'll stop preaching now thank you thank you <laughs> thank you <laughs> I, I was wanting to just add to what Anna was saying, like, like for my, for me personally, like I don't think there are a lot of people out there that feel a hundred percent fully par on everything that is that they know everything that is in the Fijian cultural handbook. You know, there's always something that you have yet to learn, and you'll always be learning something new. Like, if I, for an example. I speak my dialect fluently, but I don't speak standard Fijian or the Bowen dialect. 
And um, when I was young, I used to feel really inadequate in a way because of that. So not Fijian enough, so to speak, as well as, you know, some people say, oh, you don't have Fijian here. You don't uh, speak like a, you know, the good Fijian woman. You don't behave like one. You're very opinionated and aggressive. So you, there's always going to be people and opinions that sort of try to make you feel like you're not Fijian enough. But it's really just, mm. I've come to the, what's the word, to reconcile it as, I know who I am. I am a Fijian woman and, I, and being Fijian is how I would like to interpret it to be and how I would want to navigate this world. You know, as a Fijian woman and it's it's on my terms. So, if, you know, don't worry about the naysayers. And the, I think what has also helped is being very, what's the word, being very, um, I'm gonna use this word in the last session. I can't remember it well, but being very, um, particular with the kind of people you use as barometers or measures of you know how you are learning Fijianness and how you are in the world. I think it's important that we choose wisely the kind of ancestors that we will you know get, get, gain that kind of knowledge from. Yeah, good point. Yeah, yeah, really, really good point. So, who do you allow to influence your views? yes yeah. yeah like i wouldn't if there is an elder who who is an elder in the community yes i would recognize this is an elder but it'll hardly be the barometer for what my cultural direction would be if he's beating his wife at home or if he's not such a good kind person you know mm -hmm. uh, uh. Mm -hmm. so Ola, would you like to add anything or did you have any thoughts that you'd like to um, share? Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm following what you're saying and I, and I agree with you. And um, like, it's like, like you, um, Philo was saying, it, it is about, you know, sort of um, making the decisions and understanding why you're making these decisions. You know, this is what I believe, you know, and it is about education and, um, you know, but when you, when you come to a situation, you know, when people are in, in a situation of, of any kind, it's, you will see it through your eyes and then other, somebody else might see it from a different point of view. So it's, it's sort of being mindful about that. So like you were saying about, you know, um, mm. here is, here is a, a, somebody who's very high powered in their job. But like you said, if they are beating their wife, we know the way we've been brought up, that isn't right. So you have to sort of like think around it, you know, um, how, how you handle that and perceive that. But, you know, just remembering that everything has two sides to it and being able to sort of make that judgment yourself, I mean. Um, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, that does make sense. So, um, and like, like I was saying about um, in the last one, um, nowadays being very, you know, as we're becoming more multicultural, we're meeting people from um, in our everyday life that have got different upbringings and will have, um, where they have different upbringings, you know, they will have different values and standards. So um, it's having to, having, um, what's it, the knowledge to listen to them, to understand how they work. Because sometimes they, you know, you learn all the time. It's, it's we're learning, it's how we grow, you know, going forward. So if you've just sort of like fixed in your ideas, mm -hmm. then um, it, it can, it can come back to hurt you because you'll wonder why people are, have, are progressing and you know and, and it's the way the way life is isn't it you know people will go go ahead of you um so it's having that open-minded mindless to be able to you know sort of look, keep learning all the time and you know understanding everybody around you um and seeing their points of view you know so if, if you see somebody doing something wrong it's 
um, I, this is my opinion, I always think that um, why are they, it's trying to understand them, think, why are they doing them? What makes them think like that? Mm. You know, yeah. and you know, because like you said, as we said about facts and opinions, you know, why have they come up with that opinion? That's obviously something in their upbringing. So it is understanding and, and it's just taking, you know, five minutes to think why, why are they like that? So, mm. yeah, so, so, um, yeah, so I might be going off on a bit of a tangent here, but so <laughs> bring myself it back in. Thank you. Paula. It's I a think... really good point though. Sorry. Yeah, no, it is. Because it's uh, like one of the things I've been learning is it's levels of awareness. So just being aware that everybody is operating at different levels of awareness, you know, and they bring who they are. And so when they do something where the behavior maybe is different to what, how you would behave or how you would respond, right. they're all doing the best that they can based on their levels of awareness, you know? Mm, so yeah. that, that's quite liberating, I think, when you kind of approach life that way and you just think, okay, that's where they're at, but that's not where I'm at. So I'm gonna keep doing me because this is my levels of level of awareness. Yeah. Um, but that's what they're at. So, you know, I, maybe if they will allow me to kind of share my level of awareness, then maybe they're willing to kind of see a different, see, see things a different way, which is what Ulla was talking about in terms of just being open to growth and being teachable and all of that. But if they're not there, then that's where they're at, you know? And, and I think that should, should not dampen our spirits and our response to life and to whatever we have to deal with on a, on a, on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. I, I think so we I'm are very positive, aren't we? We're very positive in how we think, mm. but we have to recognize that, you know, sometimes when you, you meet people from different cultures and um, you, you will see that they aren't the same way. They don't work the same way. Um, I have um, like uh, Polish friends and they're very, fact this is the fact this is what I must do and you know and but th there's it's how they're, they're they're taught so you can't mm. fault them for that but you know that's how they're taught so and but you sort of learn to work with them and think oh actually have you thought about this and you know for, but we learn from each other so mm. they'll teach me things I will teach them things but you have to have that openness open-mindedness to be able to you know sort of be open to that person mm -hmm. so yeah so it just sets you up better yeah. to, to face life you know yeah yeah thank you ladies yeah. uh, shall we move on to the next question yeah yeah so uh Ola, that's your question okay so um so my opinion i believe I believe that I am privileged because I've been brought up in England and um, I've embraced the education that is offered here, um, which has given me options. Mm. Um, with, with my Fijian upbringing, I have been able to apply this in my work and my family ethics. Um, so this is out to all you ladies. What are you thankful for about being Fijian in England? Okay, who wants to go first? <laughs> I'll let you ladies, I'm not in England, so, but I've got so many things to be thankful for about, about, um, about being, you know, about being, being born in England, I mean, I'm truly, it's such a privilege, you know, to, to have um, been born in England, being raised in England for the, for, for, my, for the formative years of my life. And then coming back to Fiji um, and then going back to England. And then I think Sai mentioned this, you know, when she came back to Fiji, it was like sh something made sense. And I, I felt that way when I went back to England something really did make sense. I felt like I belonged. And I think that was because I was raised my formative years between when I was born until when I was about five or six was in England. And, and so just how you're socialized, I think just um, so grateful for that early socialization because it's helped me be the person that I am today. 
um, it's helped me navigate like the different spaces so well, you know, and then when I did come back to England, I did go back to England and get an education. Um, I did my first degree and I did my master's when I was back in the UK through the British system because I had a British passport. It was a lot easier for me to do that, you know, and, um, and just so many things, you know, like Yorkshire tea and just coming back for Christmas, celebrating Christmas, you know, just the whole birthdays, just the culture of being, um, of being, yeah, of being British, of learning and just the way, I mean, I remember when we were children, just this whole things about please and thank yous, you know, um, that's when I was, when we were socialized like that. So that's been with me all my life. Mm -hmm. I think I say please and thank you so many times in one day, I need to start <laughs> counting. But it's just becomes part of, you know, the way that you you do life. And I'm truly thankful for, for being in England. That's what's taught, that's what's taught me all those things. And yeah, just being exposed to the education. I have you know, like, um, yeah, family now. Everybody's living in England. So just a lot, a lot to be grateful for. There's so much to be grateful for. So I th I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you Anna thank you Ulla it's a great question for me I I really enjoyed like the privacy and like being anonymous so yeah. uh, my family mm. we moved to Suva from the village when I when when we started having to go go to school so I lived in Suva for all of my life and when you grow up in Suva it's not really big you sort of like because it's so small you you know everyone everyone is related somehow so you had no privacy so even you know silly things like if you wanted to try to go underage clubbing before the night is over the bouncers already called your dad to tell him you know things like that you see in somewhere that you always go, there's really no sense of privacy. Whereas here in England, I've really, in the UK, I've appreciated, because it's so big, you can be like unknown or anonymous. So I think I really came to realize this. When I, a few months into moving to the UK, I, I went and studied in uh, Brighton and I lived in student accommodation. And then one night I locked myself out of my room and then I had to catch the bus to go into campus to get a, a, a spare key so I could get back in. And mind you, it was like 11 o'clock at night. I was in my pajamas, in slippers, and I had to catch the bus. And then I was sitting in the bus and I looked around me. No one blinked or cared. Or, and then it hit me. You know, it's like nobody knows you here. You really, you know, whatever you do, no one's going to know about it because you will probably not see these people again. And I loved it. And it was a bit of a shocking moment <laughs> for me. But I absolutely loved the idea that no one knows you and, you know, you can do things and no one will know about it. <laughs> Those are one of the things I love about being in the UK, that you can be, the, you can be anonymous. Mm. So mysterious. <laughs> yeah <laughs> small country problems <laughs> yeah small country problems <laughs> yeah thank you Philo thank you um yeah I think for me I just I'd probably like to second and third what Anna and Ula said about education I am so grateful for that I just I'm really grateful to have had the education that I've had and also um, in my current job because I teach autistic children and just the amount of different like um, uh, uh, training that I get the different types of therapies that I'm like open to that I've never I don't think I would have ever come across like play therapy, music therapy, dance, all these sort of things that are just so new and different. I, I'm so grateful to to um, be able to to learn new things um, con like continuously all the time. I'm just learning and learning and I'm really grateful for that. The education system, going to university, the experience that I had, um, studying something that I love. Uh, I studied linguistics, which is something that I'm really into. So I'm so grateful for that too. Um, yeah.
It's something that Great. I'm grateful for. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, well, what was your question again? <laughs> um, so I just, I said that I believe that I'm privileged um, to, to live in England and been brought up over here. And I've embraced the education that mm. is offered here, mm. uh, which has given me options. Mm. So with, and with my Fijian upbringing, um, I was able to apply this in my work and family ethics so uh what what are you th thankful for about being fijian in england i'm thankful that i am a fijian in england rather than any other race um yeah like um like the panel has already said I'm thankful that for the opportunities mm. I feel extremely privileged that I've been able to do certain things but I'll also admit that there were times where I felt like my friends living in Fiji were more privileged than I mm. so I've had this um, I've also experienced the side of it where I didn't think that I had privilege at one point I felt like I was just going through the motions of school study exams graduate and then my comfort zone was education so it was just on to another degree and I used to think that my friends at home were privileged in Fiji but now as an adult I realize that that's my privilege the fact that I am thinking that for them to just be in Fiji, they're the ones who are lucky. So it's really made me think of um, think of life in a different way and think of my position as a Fijian here in the UK very differently. So I studied anthropology and that was something that I was able to do because I was interested in it. I didn't necessarily need to go to university to study something that wouldn't waste my parents' money because I, it was afforded, like I managed to, I was part of the system here, so I could afford to study something that I actually was passionate about rather than something that would give me thousands of pounds, yeah. <laughs> which I'm finding now. But I do have a good job now, and that's all part of the privilege that I've had of growing up in the UK. And I think sometimes... For me, I got it confused with my friends in Fiji, living in the islands, being able to just call each other up and see each other. I thought that I had it had had it hard over here, but now I've come to realise that that's my that's my privilege talking. <clears throat> mm. And really, if they were in my position I think they would uh, a lot of people in Fiji would rather be here and be able to go to university and not have um, debt and bills and have to worry about things and being able to just travel to any country on a 30 pound air ticket so yeah. I'm grateful for the fact that I'm a Fijian living in the UK because my identity as a Fijian helps me to remain conscious of my privilege whilst living here but I also hope that I can continue to use it to somehow um, make some change in the world for mm. our little country and how people see it and how we see the world and encourage everybody mm. who's like me to embrace who they are I've forgotten what I was saying thank you <laughs> beautiful yeah yeah thank yeah, you Sai. that was good yeah that was lovely yeah, it was really good okay. yeah all right um okay so now did anybody else want to add to that no um, i would i no i won't 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> Because that would be my hat as a mother and not as a panelist. I'll stop here. But thank you, Sai. That was beautifully said. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, I just wanted to add, sorry, Sai. It made me think of um, the last session on the story of Marcy, you know, with Katri Dr. Katrina. Mm. Like, as I think that's a privilege we have here as Fijians in the UK is the fact that a lot of our artifacts are stored in museums around the UK. Yeah. Yes. Like, you know, you can go and see these things. Mm. Like the Masi, some other things that the early missionaries and um, the colonial administration have collected and brought back. I didn't realize how, just how large of an extent, the amount of stuff that, that is here until I listened in to Katrina's session. And I think mm -hmm. it's an amazing thing for us Fijians here. Mm. Mm. My sister was, um, she worked with the what's it, Heritage and Culture back in Fiji. And um, she, she brought a lot of the artifacts over, um, was it Norwich a few years ago? And um, I think on the Marama Alliance the other night, they were showing the book that was written with all the artifacts and everything. Yeah. And, yeah, so it was very, very good. So if anybody gets the chance to go and have a look, it's really worth it. Most yeah. definitely. Okay, so we're almost on the hour, but that's okay. Are you, are you ladies okay if we go on for at least, for maximum another 30 minutes? Yeah. Just yeah. allow time for the final question and a summary. Yeah. Thank All you. Good. Okay, so uh, if we could have the last and final question from Philo, please. My question is, um, as Fiji, this is for everyone, by the way, as Fijian women, what has your experience been, been like as a Fijian woman in the UK? And what has your experience been like as a Fijian woman in Fiji? Great question. So, oh, um, <laughs> I just, I love this question. Thank you, Philo. I, I just, um, and maybe, because this is some, it's an area that I've become really passionate about. And I think my passion to study, uh, and I study gender, gender and culture and development really came from my trying to understand the way that women are treated in England and the way that women are treated in Fiji. So as a child growing up in England, I have three, I have uh, three brothers and when I was growing up, so my, I was socialized around whatever the boys can do, you can do, you know? The boys run around, the boys climb the trees, you can climb the tree, you can run around, that's, that's all good. And then we were uprooted from England and brought back to Fiji. And my socialization into the Fijian village when we came back was so like the boys were just separate from the girls and the boys could do whatever, like they could go swimming, they could go jumping off the trees, you know, and doing whatever. And I was, um, as a girl, I started to really sense this uh, difference in the things that were expected of me. Um, and just the way that, you know, the, there were so many things that you're not allowed to do. Like, you're not allowed to do anything in the village, you know? Tambungo, tambuya. So like your whole socialization is around what you're not supposed to do as you're kind of, you know, um, when you're trying to navigate through the village as a child. Oh, as I was as a, as a girl, as a girl child. Um, and so, and then I saw um, the way that my mom was being treated in the village. And I thought, wow, this is so interesting. And so when I, when I managed to kind of get to university, when I did come back to England, I did my dissertation on cross-cultural feminism. And then I did my master's in gender culture and development because I really wanted to unpack this. And I really tried to understand what, what is going on, you know? And I started to see um, the, just the way, um, yeah, in our Fijian communities, how we, uh, how we treat women and men differently. Um, and, and we play into those roles so well as Fijian women. That's our socialization. We walk into a function, the men are there, the women are there, you know? And then the women are in the kitchen, the women are doing the serving, the men are being served, the men are doing the grog, you know, it's the gender roles are so clear. Um, 
and I think um, it's something that I guess we just need to discuss a bit more and to be to be aware of why we do what we do and to be aware of the dynamics of our relationships and how those relationships can also influence the way that we see ourselves and the way that we see the world. Um, and do we think less of ourselves as Fijian women in Fiji? Um, and do when you come to England, do you feel that you have more opportunity to really be who you are? You know, like feel like what you talked about earlier, just nobody knows you. So you can operate in your in or in who you, as you who you are. But when you come back into being part of a Fijian community, you play into a role, you become a different person or more, like you become another person. And Ola mentioned this in one of our discussions, you know, you in the earlier discussion, you're Fijian when you walk into the door, when you walk out the door, you're British. Um, yeah, but as a woman, I think it's something that we, that I, I struggle with. Um, and Cersei talked about it, you know, in the, in the other talk. Like when you go to church, Sulira, no fan, and the basket. So you play into this proper Fijian woman role. And then who are you? But like, who are you really, you know? Yeah. And, and is that like just these things that we do, we navigate it seamlessly, you know? We, we wake up, you know exactly what's expected of you and you do it. Um, but I think it's important that we start to kind of just be aware of what we're doing and why we're doing it and be aware of the power dynamics of the relationships that we have, you know? And, um, you know, recognizing that, um, yeah, as a woman, um, finding your voice and just being able to use, um, to use your voice to encourage other women, um, that it's okay to be amazing, it's okay to be wonderful, and, you know, that you, 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 can, you can shine um, as who you are, as a Fijian woman, and it doesn't make you less of a person, uh, even though the Fijian, some Fijian people in the Fijian community might make you feel like that. So that's my spill. Thank you. <laughs> well, great question. Thank you, Philo. I love the question. Can I can I talk next? Um, so uh, I just want to expand on um, what Anna's just said. Um, so for myself, I mean, I spent the first 20 years of my life um, working in McDonald's and I started off as a crew member and I finished as a restaurant manager. And um, when I worked for them, it was uh, the, 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 um, the McDonald's philosophy was um, look after the children for tomorrow because they will be your customers. And because of that, that's what they, if you notice, they focused all their work ethics on, you know, the children, because now that they're all adults, they are the people that are the customers. So taking that into account, I um, have always thought, actually, you know, as things have changed such a lot since when I was younger to what it has now. So when I am doing things, I'm setting up things for my children and the children for the future. Uh, this is my, how I see things. So, as I said, I, I embrace that, you know, um, that when I was brought up, you know, um, my dad was the head of the household and we all, you know, ran around and did everything for dad because, you know, when dad came in, you know, we made sure his food was on the, the table because that's how we were. But, you know, now as time's moved on, now dad's not with us anymore and, um, sort of mum's, um, the way her dynamics have changed. She's now with my brother and um, everybody's, you know, sort of roles have changed. So the way um, people in society are changing is that we, as I keep saying, we're becoming a very diverse um, um, sort of nation and that our children are being brought up, you know, sort of amongst British people so that they will learn the cultures from them like we said, picking up good things and bad you know, things. So we have to recognize that, you know, in the future, that's probably the way it's gonna be. So although at the moment we are still following on our traditions and we, we will take, we will continue with our traditions, but we have to recognize that, you know, in England, women are more equal to men, but, you know, maybe not so much in Fiji, but, you know, is it time that we, 
start making those changes that allowing the women to have the same sort of roles and you know it, you know it's going forward it's that forward planning do we wait for for the rest of you know every, all the other nations to overtake us and we're still in the you know old age or do we go with everybody else and make those changes and allow women to come up the same as men because in this day and age as well um uh, there are a lot of single parent women that you know are bringing up their children on their own and so and they will go out and sometimes earn more than the male so um going back to our question which was <laughs> <laughs> well, how as, as a fijian woman what is your experience like when you are in Fiji and what is your experience like as a woman when you are in the UK as a Fijian woman? So, uh, you know, as I said, you know, I, I find that when I go back to, you know, went uh, back to Fiji, it was, I had to keep to the traditions and, you know, um, recognize my place. But here in England now, I know that, um, so um, we live, we live, there isn't a distinct distinguishing line between male and female. We both go to work. We both do everything. We cook for each other. Whoever comes in first will do that. And it is going with the times and things are, are changing. And it's just how long until we, you know, Fijians, old Fijians, you know, recognize that is the way it has to be to survive. So yeah, so that's my experience and where I, how I think we're going. Thank you, Una. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> was that a bit too deep? <laughs> no, I think it was good. We're all just thinking about it slowly. <laughs> yeah, I think I think women will become up there, you know, in the future. They, they, if women, you know, they're just as equal as as males. You know, like you said, there'll be people that are carpenters. Who are very good at doing that and there will be people who are good at care fijians are normally good at the care side but it's recognizing people's strengths and those that can do the job and you know and that's going forward you know sort of how i i will see things you know that people are recognizing other people's strengths and you need people of different skills to make your community a good one and stronger mm -hmm. i agree so thank you, ladies. <laughs> Brittany, do you want to share? Um, well, I, I spent most of my life here in the UK. So, you know, in the UK, it's all about equality, gender equality. And so I'm used to that. And, you know, my parents always said the same, you know, whatever a boy can do, I can do as well. But my, yeah, I think my experience going back to Fiji on holiday and things like that and to see family I don't need to be I have never like my parents have never told me oh you need to dress a certain way I just see it like I, I just I just know oh so I, I do like I do go up to my parents and say do I need to wear this before, I, before we go here what do I wear to church I'm constantly trying to me and my sisters my sisters and I are all trying to think oh what do we need to wear to this and how, how are we supposed to present ourselves because it's just so visible like mm. Anna said like it's you just see it the um yeah, the women here and the men here and what we do so differently and the women in the kitchen. So when we're at our auntie's house and when we're at different functions at church, so we're automatically drawn to the kitchen <laughs> anyway, because that's where all our girl, like, girl cousins are and stuff. So, so yeah, um, it is true. It's so visible and we just adapt to it. Like I, I was, I've been in the UK since I was about seven and I've never had to been I've, I've never been told by my parents about that I've just seen it it's it's mm. so visible in the Fijian culture um yeah so that's that's just my experience and and it's it is so different so different here in the UK I think men are more scared to <laughs> say anything against women here in the workplace and stuff like that so yeah it's it's really different and um yeah, it's completely visible in the Fijian culture, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Oh. Um, yeah, I guess this, 
Um, I've forgotten the question again. Um, I just can I just jump in? So sorry, sorry. Did I just just I think like in Fijian, especially like when you introduce yourself. Uh, and the first question is, is where's your father from? Mm. And then if it's not, where's your father from? Where's your husband from? <laughs> so you're either identified as your father's daughter or your husband's wife. Yeah. But if you don't have a husband and you, you don't like, your, who are you? you know, in, in the future. But your identity as a Fijian woman is linked to who your father is or who your husband is. Mm. Like, introduce yourself. Mm. Like, that's it, you know? And, yeah. and so immediately the association is with your husband. So that's your identity, which is fascinating. I find that so interesting. Mm. But I'm sorry, sorry about jumping in, but the, the, the mm. yeah. I just thought, I just wanted to add that, yeah. Mm. That's so it is quite an interesting observation to make when you see it happening. For me, I found it very strange when I first got married. I like he, even here in the UK, we'd meet other Fijians, other Fijian men in particular, mm. and they would only speak to my husband while I'm standing uh -huh. right beside. Him. They would uh -huh. not acknowledge me or even look at me, and I found that really interesting. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, why is that? Okay, I don't know. <laughs> um, was, okay, so for me, my, my experience as a Fijian woman in the UK, um, in comparison to my experience as a Fijian woman in Fiji, I guess is very similar to that of Brittany's where I grew up and I kind of just started to notice that there were differences. So in England, when I was growing up, I'd always wear tracksuit bottoms and trainers and I was a bit of a tomboy. But then whenever I used to go to Fiji and I'd be with my grandparents, it was church and I was told you can't wear jeans to church. So then I'd have to bring out my one and only Sudo and Chamba, which I hated, but then I eventually grew to love. And it was a learning process, but one that I was told about, but not in a really negative way. And I'm not sure if that's because I grew up in the UK and I went back to Fiji. So I'm not sure if I was given that type of um, approach because my, like the adults in my life were looking at me as a little British girl coming to Fiji. So it was kind of like, you can usually get away with it, but today, here, wear this. So it was like, okay, sometimes, some, day, yeah, some days I can get away with it and some days I can't. So even going to my my mom's village, even if I was wearing shorts, it would just be like, just put a sulu on or just put a sulira over your, whatever you're wearing, mm -hmm. walk into the house. And once you're in Tukar's house, you'll be okay. Mm -hmm. So I kind of understood that it was, more of a, um, it was like an identity or something that I had to do when there was more people around mm. rather than when I was just at home with my family. Mm. And I guess I never had any negative um, thoughts about it or I never saw it in a negative way. Mm. And now how I see it is it's actually quite cool because there are a lot more things that you can learn from just hanging out with the women than you would learn if we were all sat together. So I like mm. the fact that um, when you do go to Fiji or when you are with in the Fijian community, often, you know, like there are occasions here in the UK where everybody just mixes together. But when you do separate, you kind of get to have different type of conversations. And I like that. And sometimes here in the UK, we I miss, we miss that because everybody's just so involved in everything else, male, female, every, you know, like we're meant to be seen as equal. Yeah, well, that's that's how I how I see it. And yeah, interesting. Oh. Thank yeah. you. Those are really interesting answers to my question. <laughs> and how about for you, Philo? For me, what I've the most there are a lot of different things that you experience 
as a Fijian woman here in the UK and when as a Fijian woman in, in Fiji, I think one of the most, God, I think even preparing for this session, it made me really sit down and think, I was like, I don't have much to offer to this discussion because I don't feel like duality really is an issue for me. Like I see the, I view the world as a, as a Fijian. When I make my comparisons, it's from a very Fijian lens, I realize. So I didn't feel like I had a lot of, uh, of a lot, a much I could add to this discussion. But then I, I feel, I realize that I do experience duality in different ways in my own identity, you know, the different hats I wear. Mm. So um, just going back to, oh yes. So as a, here in the UK, I, I, I have realized, and it's not such a bad thing for me. It's, I am, I see myself as an outsider looking in and observing and, you know, trying to learn how they do things here, what their history is. I find it really fascinating. So I see myself as an outsider and not in a negative way. Mm. In Fiji, I, I'm, I'm a, a Fijian in my home, you know, I'm home. Mm. So it's the, I'm an outsider here, I'm an insider back in Fiji for me personally. And um, mm. in terms of another thing I see, I experience very differently here and in Fiji, I think is one of the biggest contrasts is I was walking down one hill a few days ago because I hadn't timed it well. I walked down and it was already getting dark. So I was literally walking by myself through the forest down a hill and I didn't feel afraid at all. Mm. And I was like, you know, in Fiji, this would not be the case. Unfortunately, as a woman, I feel safer in public spaces, in the dark I, here than I do in Fiji on the streets. As a young woman growing up, you sort of are normalized into thinking that this is just how things are. You know, the catcalling, the harassment on the streets, it's normal from the minute you walk out the door. It's not something, it was weird for me when I came here that it wasn't the case, but really that is how things should be. Yeah. But it was the norm yeah. as a, for me as a young woman growing up in Fiji and as a woman when you're walking on the streets, it's the norm. And it's, a, it's quite unfortunate for me, but the, that's one of the differences I've, I've noticed as a Fijian woman here in the UK and a Fijian woman in Fiji. Thank you, fellow. Mm. Yeah. Um, hmm? No, I, I just, I was just. This, it's such a good, good discussion. I think it's a, there's so much richness in just this one, this this discussion um, about being a woman in England and being a woman in Fiji. But I, I just wanted to reflect maybe on something that you said, Sai, where you, you, you know, I, I like the way you highlighted the um, the joys of just in gatherings where the women gather together and you can hear from the women when they're separate from the men. But also I recognize that in your, in, in your sharing that, again, it was like what you said earlier, it's from a position of privilege. You know, it's, your, it's the lens that you see the world through, which is quite a privileged lens. Um, and I think for a lot of women who navigate these differences or this they in in Fiji in particular they don't have choice you know so we speak from a very privileged position like in, in a lot of our communities this is the way things are and that's the way that you do things you know so you don't have the option of stepping out from that and going back into an equal world and then engaging with the unequal relationships which are quite beautiful when you like to you know when you and then you step back out again and you go back into your e equal into your equal your position of equality so I guess I just I just thought you know and and Phil you you just the whole thing which is where we really see these differences is when you're out on the street you know when people talk to the males in your life and not the they can kind of completely their eyes glaze over when they see you you don't exist without a man next to you or a, or a father you know um, and so these are just such interesting things that we navigate, I think, as women, as Fijian women, um, which I think is just always really good to talk about, because in the discussions, we realize a lot of things as well. Yeah. Um, and we're able to kind of, yeah, just talk about it. Mm. But that's it there. That's my, 
That'd be, thank you. Thank you. Would uh, anybody else like to add anything before before we summarize and any any thoughts that you had or anything that you'd like to share? No? Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, <clears throat> thank you, ladies, for a rich and wonderful discussion. I think um, I think this evening we really was with the questions that you've posed to each other and the discussions that we've let naturally and organically flow from it, we've really allowed um, space and interpretation for different types of duality and identity. And if anything, I believe tonight's discussion has really <clears throat> reiterated that sometimes it's not as simple. So we can't look at it as Fijian identity, as British identity, as British Fijian identity, it's not um, it's not something that's linear. Mm. It's complex, um, like Ulla said, it's mm. diverse. We there are different things that make us who we are. If we build on from the language discussion last week, we have we are one country, but we have hundreds of different languages. You know, Philo saying that her her with her identity she can speak her dialect <clears throat> but not necessarily in Bowen very well and that just shows that it's not necessarily something simple mm -hmm. and I think mm -hmm. that's that's a beautiful thing and I feel that perhaps in my opinion and it seems the way that the discussion has gone today is that when we try to make it one rule or one shoe fits all is when we really start to have problems with one another mm -hmm. when we really start to sort of like face objections within our own diaspora and our community but really um tonight's discussion and this whole um <clears throat> series has just reinforced the idea that to be fijian is to be diverse no matter like how fijian you are where your parents are from where you're from in the country, if you can speak the language or not, your age, your gender, it's something that is um, multifaceted. And I'm really grateful that we were able to have this conversation. I believe that tonight's session was perhaps fit to close the series. And really this whole discussion was um, just a great way to bring together different generations and just to have everybody sit in a safe space and share how they feel. And I'd really like to just thank our panelists. So everybody who's joined us from group one, um, Brittany, Peniasi and Tiko, group two, so Philo, um, Tautalunimi, Ratu Glenn, Lotte and Lulu, and group three who we had um, Anna and Ola, Sosi and uh, Anna Harvey. I think um, I think we need to continue these type of discussions, and it's something that, as a community, we should. I hope that this encourages people to talk more and talk a little bit more freely, mm -hmm. in terms of giving each other the space that they need for us to be able to respect one another, but also understand that just because we have different um, experiences, different ideas and different interpretations of the world around us and our identity and what our culture means to us, it doesn't change the fact that we are all Fijian and that is one thing that will always bring us together mm -hmm. and as a community if we can continue to just encourage one another. So just before we close I'd like to read, so I know we started off with uh, a working definition of cultural resilience this week, but I'd like to close with just a little thought on cultural identity. So this is from Stuart Hall and he's an anthropologist, but he mentions that identity always refers to the past, but we reconstruct the past once we lay claim to it in the present. In this way, the past undergoes constant transformation. 
So I think perhaps if I just close with that this evening and if we can all, wherever you are, like whenever you're watching this, if you're gonna watch this on our YouTube, just think about how our identity will refer to the past, past experiences, memories from grandparents, from parents, from elders in the village and the community. But once we think of it and reconstruct it, we're laying claim to it in the now. And this is where we are now. Mm. And I'd like to just thank you all for being here and thank all the viewers. Thank you so much for joining us and following us on this journey. And this is the end of our, uh, oh, it's a bit emotional. <laughs> this is the end of our intergenerational dialogue on cultural resilience. But hopefully we'll, we'll be able to bring back another series of intergenerational dialogues, but we'll just have to see how that goes. So and I wish everybody good health and may you all be safe. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you for Thank you for wonderful job. Thank you.